Section fifty three of Reviews by Oscar Wilde. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Karen Savage. Reviews by Oscar Wilde. Edited by Robert Ross. Section fifty three. A Scotchman on Scottish Poetry. Pall Mall Gazette, October twenty fourth, eighteen eighty seven. A distinguished living critic, born south of the Tweed, once whispered in confidence to a friend that he believed that the Scotch knew really very little about their own national literature. He quite admitted that they love their Robbie Burns and their Sir Walter with a patriotic enthusiasm that makes them extremely severe upon any unfortunate sovereign who ventures to praise either in their presence. But he claimed that the works of such great national poets as Dunbar, Henryson, and Sir David Lindsay are sealed books to the majority of the reading public in Edinburgh, Aberdeen, and Glasgow, and that few Scotch people have any idea of the wonderful outburst of poetry that took place in their country during the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries, at a time when there was little corresponding development in England. Whether this terrible accusation be absolutely true or not, it is needless to discuss at present. It is probable that the archaism of language alone will always prevent a poet like Dunbar from being popular in the ordinary acceptation of the word. Professor Veitch's book, however, shows that there are some, at any rate, in the land of cakes, who can admire and appreciate their marvellous early singers, and whose admiration for the Lord of the Isles and the verses to a mountain daisy does not blind them to the exquisite beauties of the testament of the Cressid, the thistle and the rose, and the dialogue betwixt experience and ain courtier. Taking as the subject of his two interesting volumes the feeling for nature in Scottish poetry, Professor Veitch starts with a historical disquisition on the growth of the sentiment in humanity. The primitive state he regards as being simply a sort of open-air feeling. The chief sources of pleasure are the warmth of the sunshine, the cool of the breeze, and the general fresh aspect of the earth and sky, connecting itself with a consciousness of life and sensuous enjoyment, while darkness, storm, and cold are regarded as repulsive. This is followed by the pastoral stage, in which we find the love of green meadows, and of shady trees, and of all things that make life pleasant and comfortable. This, again, by the stage of agriculture, the era of the war with earth, when men take pleasure in the cornfield and in the garden, but hate everything that is opposed to tillage, such as woodland and rock, or that cannot be subdued to utility, such as mountain and sea. Finally we come to the pure nature-feeling the free delight in the mere contemplation of the external world, the joy in sense-impressions, irrespective of all questions of nature's utility and beneficence. But here the growth does not stop. The Greek, desiring to make nature one with humanity, peopled the grove and hillside with beautiful and fantastic forms, saw the god hiding in the thicket, and the naiad drifting with the stream. The modern Wordsworthian, desiring to make man one with nature, finds in external things the symbols of our inner life, the workings of a spirit akin to our own. There is much that is suggestive in these early chapters of Professor Veitch's book, but we cannot agree with him in the view he takes of the primitive attitude towards nature. The open-air feeling of which he talks seems to us comparatively modern. The earliest nature myths tell us not of man's sensuous enjoyment of nature, but of the terror that nature inspires. Nor are darkness and storm regarded by the primitive man as simply repulsive. They are to him divine and supernatural things, full of wonder and full of awe. Some reference also should have been made to the influence of towns on the development of the nature feeling. For, paradox though it may seem, it is none the less true that it is largely to the creation of cities that we owe the love of the country. Professor Veitch is on a safer ground when he comes to deal with the growth and manifestations of this feeling, as displayed in Scotch poetry. The early singers, as he points out, had all the medieval love of gardens, all the artistic delight in the bright colours of flowers and the pleasant song of birds, but they felt no sympathy for the wild, solitary moorland, with its purple heather, its grey rocks, and its waving bracken. Montgomery was the first to wander out on the banks and braes, and to listen to the music of the burns and it was reserved for Drummond of Hawthornden to sing of flood and forest, and to notice the beauty of the mists on the hillside and the snow on the mountain-tops. Then came Alan Ramsay, with his honest, homely pastorals, Thompson, who writes about nature like an eloquent auctioneer, and yet was a keen observer, with a fresh eye and an open heart, Beatty, who approached the problems that Wordsworth afterwards solved, the great Celtic epic of Ossian, such an important factor in the romantic movement of Germany and France, 
Ferguson, to whom Burns is so much indebted, Burns himself, Leyden, Sir Walter Scott, James Hogg, and, Longo Intervallo, Christopher North, and the late Professor Shep. On nearly all these poets Professor Veitch writes with fine judgment and delicate feeling, and even his admiration for Burns has nothing absolutely aggressive about it. He shows, however, a certain lack of the true sense of literary proportion in the amount of space he devotes to the last two writers on our list. Christopher North was undoubtedly an interesting personality to the Edinburgh of his day, but he has not left behind him anything of real permanent value. There was too much noise in his criticism, too little music in his poetry. As for Professor Sherp, looked on as a critic, he was a tragic example of the unfortunate influence of Wordsworth, for he was always confusing ethical with aesthetical questions, and never had the slightest idea how to approach such poets as Shelley and Rossetti, whom it was his mission to interpret to young Oxford in his later years. While, considered as a poet, he deserves hardly more than a passing reference. Professor Veitch gravely tells us that one of the descriptions of Kilmahoe is not surpassed in the language for real presence, felicity of epithet, and purity of reproduction, and statements of this kind serve to remind us of the fact that a criticism, which is based on patriotism, is always provincial in its result. But it is only fair to add that it is very rarely that Professor Veitch is so extravagant and so grotesque. His judgment and taste are, as a rule, excellent, and his book is, on the whole, a very fascinating and delightful contribution to the history of literature. The Feeling for Nature and Scottish Poetry by John Veitch, Professor of Logic and Rhetoric in the University of Glasgow, Blackwood and Son. End of section 53. A Scotchman on Scottish Poetry.